On the behalf of the Institute on World Affairs, with funding by JSB, and on behalf of ISU Hillel, I'd like to welcome you here tonight. My name is Katherine Harbour, and I am the president of ISU Hillel. Before this evening's speaker, I would like to make a few announcements. First, I wanted to remind you that Hillel will be hosting a reception after tonight's lecture. Second, um, I'd like to let you know about a couple upcoming events. Tomorrow night, Henning Lowe's, a German journalist, will present The War in Iraq, A View from Europe. Next Monday, Winona LaDuke will be presenting Global Environmental Justice, Native Peoples, and Women. Finally, I wanted to let you know that in January, Hello will be hosting another World Affairs speaker, the Israeli Consul General, Moshe Ram. There will be information available on these events at the door after tonight's lecture. After the lecture, we will have a question and answer session, and I wanted to let you know that you should address your questions to the mic in the central aisle. Now I would like to introduce tonight's speaker. Janine Zachariah is the Washington Bureau Chief for the Jerusalem Post, Israel's English language daily newspaper, covering the Middle East from a US perspective. She also writes regularly on the US Middle East policy for the New Republic magazine, and is a diplomatic analyst for MSNBC. She spent the month of March aboard the aircraft carrier USS Theodore Roosevelt in the Mediterranean Sea as one of 600 journalists embedded in the US military. Prior to taking up her posting in Washington, Janine worked for five years in Israel as a journalist. First, on the bi-weekly magazine, The Jerusalem Report, and then for the Reuters News Agency. She has covered both the Clinton and Bush administration's attempts to broker peace in the Middle East, and I look forward to hearing her comparison of the two administrations. Please welcome Janine Zakaria. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out on uh, this rainy evening. Um, I want to thank Pat Miller for helping organize this and uh, Ron Jackson for picking me up in Des Moines. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in the castle. This is my first trip to Iowa State and my first trip to Iowa. Uh, so it's a very exciting time to be here. And um, I'm looking forward to the discussion period and hopefully I could uh, learn from you a little bit about uh, the caucuses and, and who's going to win out here uh, so I can bring something back with me to Washington. What I'm going to do tonight is um, try and talk briefly, say for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, um, and do an overview of uh, the Bush administration's efforts in the Middle East, essentially vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and, of course, Iraq. Um, and, and also perhaps talk a little bit about the media coverage of the war, and we can get into that more in the Q&A session. But I really want to leave as much time as possible for questions so I can hear from you what you're interested in talking about. Um, as you heard, I'm, I work in Washington for the, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, I cover the Middle East from a, a U.S. perspective, and um, I've been doing that for about four years now. Um, I get back to Israel, West Bank, Gaza about two times a year to do some reporting, and I was most recently there in August when we had sort of a brief uh, respite um, things were pretty calm for a couple of weeks. There was a, a temporary ceasefire, and there were a lot of tourists in Israel, um, and things seemed to be somewhat hopeful, and I think it was August 19th when you had a very bad morning in Baghdad with the bombing of the UN headquarters there, the first in these series of bombings on international targets that we've seen. And that very same day, um, sort of had a, a brief moment of hope, perhaps, on the Israeli-Palestinian front with the Israelis and the Palestinians sitting down and talking about the handover of some additional cities from Israeli control to Palestinian Authority control. Um, but that evening, that sort of derailed with a, um, a bombing on um, a bus in Jerusalem uh, when 21 people were killed, and that was the end of that sort of brief moment there was no more talk of a pullback um, and a hardening of the Israeli position that evening. And that day, you really had a double blow to the Bush administration's efforts in the Middle East, in Iraq, and in the, in the Israel-Palestinian arena. And before I talk about sort of prospects 
from a Washington perspective, perhaps for some progress on the Israeli-Palestinian front now post-Saddam, I think it's useful now that we're in an election period to sort of back up and review um, President Bush's relationship, I'd say, to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's sort of been a tortuous one. Remember, when he came to office, he didn't want to have anything to do with the conflict, right? He it was too Clinton mediating the conflict, and everything Clinton was bad. So for nine months, he pretty much didn't engage at all. They got rid of the special envoy, Dennis Ross. They pulled George Tenet, the director of the CIA, off the file. He had been doing these mediation shuttle missions. And as I said, for nine months, he ignored it. And then around August 2001, um, the Saudis in particular started putting a lot of pressure on Washington to engage, um, something that President Bush responded to personally. There was talk of a possible meeting between the president and PA chairman Yasser Arafat. Um, that was something I remember covering for a few weeks. They had not met. Bush had met several times with Ariel Sharon, the Israeli prime minister. And then we had September 11th. And I remember thinking on September 11th, beyond the horror of, that we were all feeling that day, sort of what am I going to cover? Who's going to care about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict now that we have this huge event and this new war on terror that people were talking about? But I remember on the very next day, September 12th, Secretary Powell going to the podium at the State Department. We were all asking questions about Al-Qaeda and, and the attacks. And him urging, sort of not prompted, Shimon Peres, who was the Israeli foreign minister, to meet with Yasser Arafat. At that moment, signaling that at the very least, they were going to try and keep this conflict quiet, conflict management from Washington, so that they could pursue their wider war on terror, sort of unobstructed. Then in the fall of 2001, you had a series of rhetorical gestures, I'd say, from the Bush administration to the Palestinians. Uh, President Bush went to the UN, he called for the creation of a state of Palestine, a monumental moment um, in U.S.-Palestinian relations. Secretary Powell flew to Louisville, Kentucky, he talked about ending occupation, ending Israeli occupation. Hope in Washington was that by saying these things, at very least, that perhaps there would be some movement on the PA's part, some willingness to crack down on groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad. They announced the appointment of Anthony Zinni, remember him? The uh, special envoy. And I remember when um, I actually got to go with Powell on that trip, and during his speech he said they were, he was sending retired Marine General Anthony Zinni to push and prod the sides to a ceasefire. And when we asked him what that meant, he said, you'll see what pushing and prodding means when Tony Zinni gets on the ground. Anyway, he pushed and he prodded and he pushed a little more. Israel continued with targeted killings. Um, Palestinian attacks continued on Israelis. Not a lot of progress. And then in January 2002, you had what I think was a monumental moment for President Bush with the seizure by Israel of the Korean A. You may remember the, the ship of weapons going from Iran towards Gaza. And the president asked Yasser Arafat if he knew about this. And Yasser Arafat said no. And they didn't believe him. And at that moment, I think, the president made a decision that he couldn't work with Yasser Arafat. He didn't dump him officially yet, but I think he made sort of a mental calculation. And if that was the critical moment for George Bush with Yasser Arafat, I'd say two months later, you had a critical moment for Ariel Sharon um, in late March on Passover Eve with um, a bombing at a, during a Passover Seder in the town of Netanya. I think 30 people were killed, and I think with that, the horror of that bombing in particular, Ariel Sharon decided that he wasn't going to deal with Yasser Arafat anymore either, and Israel reoccupied most, if not all, of the towns that had handed over to the Palestinian control, and you had a horrific, violent spring throughout um, last spring of 2002. Tense moment in the U.S.-Israeli relationship, too. And then finally, on June 24th, of course, we had, last year, uh, President Bush's major Middle East address, in which he officially said he wasn't going to work with Yasser Arafat and called on the Palestinians to elect new leadership. Now, at the time, we didn't know what that meant. Was it new people? Uh, was it old people with new ideas? It wasn't really clear. But what it did was, I think, free the administration up, because it takes time to get new leadership, freed them up to do what they really wanted to do, 
and had been thinking about doing since 9-11, which was regime change in Iraq. Now, as you heard, I was on the USS Theodore Roosevelt, which was one of two aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean Sea. There were another three in the Gulf. Um, just briefly, I think, being one of nine embedded reporters on the ship, it was a very interesting experience, having not done any military experience, to sort of learn about the Navy and, and understand sort of what servicemen go through and how they feel about war and, and all that. Um, but in general, I'd say the coverage was, was mixed. And again, that's something I'd be happy to talk about if you're interested in um, during the Q&A session. Anyway, we got rid of Saddam pretty quickly. And as you recall, President Bush flew on his own aircraft carrier May 1st, dressed in a flight suit. I didn't get to wear a flight suit. And he gave that sort of victory speech, even though it wasn't officially a victory speech, uh, something that the White House clarifies very routinely now. Um, but a, a declaration of an end to, to major combat, perhaps somewhat prematurely. If you go back to that speech, one of the things that struck me at the time was that in it, he mentioned weapons of mass destruction two times, and he mentioned terror, terrorists, or terrorism about 20 times. Clearly already in May, trying to shift the focus away from weapons of mass destruction to Iraq as a front line in war and terror. They realized they were having this problem locating any weapons of mass destruction um, and wanting to sort of, as I again, shift, it, shift the focus. They call it now the flypaper scenario in Washington, that jihadists, guerrillas fighting the American troops, uh, ambushing them, are now fle fleeing into Iraq. And actually, they sort of see it as a front now that they can fight. Um, now, we can get into this later, sort of the political implications of all this, but the fact that they haven't found large stashes of weapons of mass destruction doesn't seem to be what's hurting the president politically. Rather, um, although you do have these investigations in the Senate um, and other and elsewhere in Washington of sort of whether or not the U.S. exaggerated intelligence or cherry-picked it or what were they basing it on, but that two things, the price, the $87 billion price tag, some for Afghanistan, very little, and of course the casualties. Um, these are the two things that the White House is wrestling with. This is why they're rushing to train Iraqis as fast as they can to replace uh, U.S. soldiers, and I think that they probably want to get as many U.S. soldiers as they can home before the next election. Um, but if we're looking at the Bush administration's sort of handling of this conflict, say like of the Middle East as a book, and we had the, yet the fall of, of, of Saddam, and then very neatly two weeks later, we had our new Palestinian leader um, elected in late April. His name was Mahmoud Abbas, or Abu Mazen. Yasser Arafat's close um, colleague for, for 30 years, but somebody that the president felt that he could work with. Um, he met with him several times. He flew and met with him in Aqaba and Jordan, and he really felt, and he released his seven-page peace plan, the roadmap, uh, for a two-state solution. Um, now, he had a tough time. He had a tough three months as prime minister. Um, and as, a, as you all know, he ended up resigning in early September. Um, there were several reasons, I think, for why he, he failed. Um, definitely the U.S. didn't do enough to help him. Certainly Israel didn't do enough to help him. Uh, this is something that Israel's own chief of staff has said that Israel could have made more gestures to the Palestinians, could have um, re just released some of the tension in the West Bank a little more to, to make it a little easier for Abu Mazen to crack down on groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Um, but more than anything, I think, it was that Yasser Arafat didn't want him to succeed, and he undermined him, and this is something that Abu Mazen has acknowledged since in interviews and speeches as well. So now we have a new, a new Palestinian leader, sort of, a um, new cabinet, really just today, um, with a new Palestinian prime minister, uh, Abu Allah, or Ahmed Khoury. Um, but as you probably were reading in the papers today, Yasser Arafat is the one in control of the security services, um, which is something that is troubling both Washington and Israel, um, who do not believe that he will make a serious effort to deal with extremist groups. Um, Anyway, sort of thinking about the prospects now for dealing with this conflict post Saddam. Remember, one of the things that the that Washington said pre-war was that by getting rid of Saddam Hussein, it would make it easier for Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking. Um, 
Well, I don't know if that's going to happen in the immediate term. When I asked Paul Wolfowitz about this, I interviewed him last month, or actually late September now, um, about this pre-war argument that regime change um, would somehow lead to peacemaking. Um, he said in the immediate term, obviously getting rid of a, a dictator who incites terrorism, who sends checks to the families of Palestinian suicide bombers is a, is a, is a helpful thing. But in the longer run, and this is now a quote, when the Iraqis can demonstrate the possibility of a democratic representative government, I think it will have a good effect throughout the Arab world. Now that's sort of a more long-term theoretical enterprise. We saw President Bush talk about this last Thursday in his speech in, before the National Endowment for Democracy, in which he sort of made this a cornerstone of American foreign policy. Um, I'm not so sure, by the way, how, how he's going to implement that plan. Um, it was a nice speech rhetorically, but it's not clear to me how much they're really going to invest in this democratization effort. But Wolfowitz was speaking in very theoretical terms. Practically, I'd say there are a couple reasons why prospects for deep U.S. engagement, something that most people, left, right, Arabs, Israelis, whoever, acknowledge that the U.S. needs to play a strong role if there's going to be some progress on this front. But I'd say there's three or four reasons not to expect it, at least in the coming year. One is that it is all Iraq all the time in Washington right now. It's really hard to get anything else on the foreign policy agenda. Um, given the way Iraq has played out and how fragile um, and unstable the whole situation is and the fact that we're in an election year. Second, this Palestinian leadership issue that the U.S. and Israel both feel that, they're, that they can't dialogue um, with anybody on the Palestinian side because Yasser Arafat is still in control. Again, the election, the national election, I mean, they're really sort of divided their time, Bush and, and Vice President Cheney sort of between dealing with Iraq, dealing with domestic issues, and campaigning, and really doing Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking doesn't ever win you any election points um, because it's been such a um, failed enterprise so far. And lastly, because you had an attack on a U.S. convoy last week, last month rather, in Gaza, where three Americans were killed, the first time that there was a successful, um, deliberate attack on a U.S. convoy. This sent jitters, I'd say, through Washington, and they are scaling back their presence. They're not sending their special envoy back, John Wolfe, not only because of this, but also because of the general stalemate in the Israeli-Palestinian talks. So not so hopeful on U.S. engagement there. What about Ariel Sharon's vision post-Saddam? Does he have one? Well, Ariel Sharon has had an extraordinary level of backing from President Bush, probably more than any other Israeli prime minister in recent memory. This was most notable, I'd say, a few weeks ago after the October 4th bombing at a restaurant in Haifa, you might remember. And Israel decided to strike at a Palestinian terrorist training camp in, alleged, this is what they said, the U.S. agreed, um, in Syria. First time Israel attacked inside Syria in 30 years. Now you would think maybe something as bold as this, Israel attacking inside another Arab country at such a fragile moment in the Middle East might draw some kind of a rebuke from Washington, um, warning, something, but instead President Bush said that he would have done exactly the same thing. A real identification with Israel's war against um, Hamas, feeling that it's very similar to the U.S. war against Al-Qaeda. Now, if you look at Ariel Sharon's speech, he gave a speech to the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, on October 20th, two or three weeks ago. Um, he paid lip service to the roadmap, the, the, the U.S. peace plan, sort of, we accept it with 14 reservations. But then he described a period of really hunkering down. This is what he said, I'll just read. This is Ariel Sharon reflecting on um, prospects for Israeli-Palestinian peace post-Saddam. He said, it will take more time for the Arab world, and particularly Palestinian society, to understand that violence and extremism will only lead them to incalculable disaster. If we remain determined and patient, if we succeed in getting through the necessary period of waiting and ripening, if we are able to withstand the attempts to harm, murder, and weaken us, then we will be able to reap the benefits of quiet and peace. He is really describing a period of, just like I said, hunkering down, Israelis are going to have to continue to live with attacks. Um, no real new peace initiatives here, 
The one new initiative that he does describe is the fence that Israel's building. The barrier, the fence, the wall, the, whatever you want to call it. It's a mixture of everything. Um, and this is sort of what Israel's dealing with right now. Um, when I was in Israel, I saw a portion of the fence that was being built m more around southern Jerusalem, a little bit further up as well. Um, and in some areas, it's more like three fences. There's ditches. There's, there's all kinds of things. Um, and it has become over time an immensely popular project in Israel. 80% um, of Israeli Jews, according to a recent Tel Aviv University poll, support it. And the reason is because over the last three years, 127 suicide bombers have gotten in from the West Bank into Israel, which is why they feel they need some kind of barrier. There's no defensible border between Israel and the West Bank because the land dispute hasn't been resolved. Whereas there is a fence around Gaza which has kept suicide bombers out. This doesn't mean that Israelis aren't discussing and debating the route of the fence, that they aren't concerned about the way that it juts deeply into the West Bank in certain parts, the way it makes it difficult for Palestinians to commute, to get around, that there's additional checkpoints, that it's hard for them to get to their lands, to farm, and all of the issues that are being discussed. But that for the most part right now what they're focused on is simply trying to find a way to keep um, bombers out of the cities. Politically, Ariel Sharon was a reluctant convert to the fence, because if you think of a map of Israel and the way it goes, it's basically ceding most of the West Bank to the Palestinians. And there are two major parties in his coalition who do not accept the idea of a two-state solution, who do not accept the idea of ever dismantling settlements. So for him, the father of all settlements, it was a very difficult decision. Um, it's obviously a very controversial measure. I think the, there was a UN report today uh, that just came out saying there would be severe humanitarian consequences for 30% of Palestinians living in the West Bank. Um, but some of the, some of the reports, um, I think, don't sort of grasp the reasons why Israelis are supporting it. Israel says that they could reverse the fence, take down if um, the Palestinians were able to sort of stop bombers from getting in. Uh, now, the Palestinians, for their part, um, I think are suffering sort of a leadership crisis right now. There are moderate voices who I think want to be able to challenge Arafat. On the other hand, he remains immensely popular. Um, there was a new poll done by Birzeh University in the West Bank. This was from last month, October 10th to 13th, a poll of 1,200 Palestinians. 62.6% said they evaluated Arafat's performance positively. So be, even though the U.S. and Israel decided they weren't going to work with him, he's still the guy that Palestinians are supporting, which is causing a major problem. There were some other interesting paradoxes in this poll. I'll just cite a couple. Because I think both the, the Palestinian population and the Israeli population seem to be suffering a bit of schizophrenia at some times. 60.5%, 60, 60.61% 60 of Palestinians polled said they support negotiations with Israelis. Yet when they were asked if they thought Israel has a genuine desire to achieve peace, 87% said no. So majority supporting peace negotiations, but very doubtful about their peace partner. And you see similar polls on the Israeli side. Very dovish in the long term, supporting peace negotiations, dismantling settlements, majority, as part of a peace deal. Um, not unilaterally, but as part of a peace deal. And yet, deep skepticism after three years of intifada and fighting um, th that the Palestinians will ever um, sort of commit to and abide by a two-state solution. Um, sort of mixed attitudes about continuing attacks on Israeli civilians. They're referred to in the poll as military attacks. This means attacks inside cafes, on buses, bombers, suicide bombers. Asked if military attacks against Israeli civilians inside Israeli cities should stop. Only 16.4% agreed. 53.3% said yes, though, if Israel stops its attacks on Palestinian civilians. I don't know, I'm assuming that, that includes all of Israel's targeted killings um, of suspected Palestinian terrorists and the like, not just any Palestinians. Um, another couple issues, I'm just sort of going through a couple issues that are in the news right now. The logical conclusion of all this, Israel saying that they're not going to deal with Yasser Arafat, do they plan to kill him or exile him? This is something a lot of people have been wondering recently. Well, after a, a recent suicide bombing in Jerusalem, um, the cabinet met 
and they decided that they announced very publicly that they would find a way to remove him or deal with him, or I don't remember the exact word in Hebrew, but they were going to do something to him or about him, which sparked um, outrage throughout the world. Um, an Israeli cabinet minister was then asked, well, do you plan to kill him? And they said, we might, we're not ruling anything out, sparked more outrage. And they later, um, the Israeli government, government later clarified that they um, were not intending to kill him. Ariel Sharon himself said it, I think, in an interview with the Jerusalem Post. But they have continued to say that they're committed to removing him from the political arena, but they've left this deliberately vague. He had been pretty much marginalized, and now Israel's kind of helped to revive him a little bit. Um, but I don't think they have decided exactly what they're going to do, but I think that, they, that there is enough dissent within the Israeli security services that they, that they do not plan to, to kill him. Anyway, with that, with that, maybe I'll stop, and now we can open it up to questions, and I'll repeat the questions um, to make sure everybody can hear them. Thank you very much. Hi. Can you talk a little bit louder? Yes. Okay. I have two questions. Okay. Okay, did everybody hear the questions? Okay, the first question about uh, feasible, um, he did make that comment that what he was saying was I think that basically acknowledging that the US felt that Saddam Hussein was a threat to their national security, um, they wanted to try and at least get some kind of international cover, support, coalition of the willing, something to go along with it and that just saying that he was a threat wasn't going to be enough, whereas that they could build a case around the violation of UN resolutions, which is why they insisted on that. Um, and nobody in the UN, remember, disagreed that he was in violation of the resolutions. It was just whether or not he deserved to be ousted militarily by it. So that, that is what he did. That is what he said. Um, the other arguments, that he supports terror, that he's a potential menace, what he's done to his own people, uh, weren't going to be enough. Israel as an apartheid state, we need to have a discussion about what apartheid means. Is it moving in that direction? I think Israel right now is sort of in a dispute with the Palestinians over land. And you have a situation where Israel is occupying areas where Palestinians live, the areas that they gave back during peace negotiations, um, which hopefully at the end you're going to have a two-state solution Israel is going to pull back from. But to call an apartheid state right now I think is premature, no. That's a good question. What is Washington's view of Yasser Arafat? Well, I can tell you that um, I think that from what U.S. officials told me and what they told the Israelis privately, um, that they weren't too happy when Israel came out and announced that they were planning to do this, that they perhaps signaled that they might have, that if Israel wanted to do something, they could have just, just better off just doing it. They, there's this interesting problem whenever Israel does anything. Um, they don't want to let the U.S. know generally because it doesn't want, they don't want to make it seem like the U.S. is condoning it or, or whatever. They want to have autonomy. They want to act as an independent state. Um, sometimes they try and float ideas to see how the U.S. would react. And in this case, uh, the U.S. had to react um, uh, politically, um, I'd say, because of the way the Arab states were responding, because of what's going on in Iraq, by, by denouncing the idea. Um, they certainly, I think, felt that by killing him you could turn him into a martyr, that this would cause great instability, and you'd have more problems. And no love lost for Yasser Arafat. I mean, they're, they're not huge fans, um, obviously. And, and they consistently, and President Bush consistently refers to him by name as an impediment to the peace process, someone who undermined um, Abu Mazen, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
for anybody who watched 60 Minutes last night about sort of his financial dealings, I mean, he's not somebody that they want to deal with. But I, I think what they've said is that they, they, they've said publicly that they do not think that moving on him would be the right move, whether or not they would have been amenable to something like that had the Israelis not announced it, perhaps. That's it, we're done, we can have the coffee and cake. I think there is juice and something after this. Uh. Okay, everybody heard the question? Um, there have been incidents when the PA has tried, the Palestinian Authority has tried to censor the press, um, including after 9-11, when there were some celebrations. I don't know the extent of them because I wasn't there, but that there were some celebrations after the 9-11 attacks. And I don't know how successfully they, they, they stopped the footage, but I know that there, there was an effort to. I do know personally of reporters who have had their film confiscated by the Palestinian Authority. Uh, the most famous example was after the lynch um, of Israeli soldiers in Ramallah in October 2000, right? Yeah. Shortly after the, after the start of the Intifada, and the Italian, uh, the, the, the Palestinian t t cameraman worked for an Italian news agency and had to send an apology letter to the Palestinian Authority saying he wouldn't do that again. So there are examples of that. Um, in the Arab world, um, you have certain things that are just not acceptable to broadcast. It was very hard, for example, to get information about what happened in the Saudi bombing this week. Um, you really, it was, took hours to figure out how many dead, what was going on. It's nothing that they really want publicized. Israel, for its part, censors anything that deals with um, Israel's nuclear program. That's the one taboo there. Could you um, perhaps rephrase the first question again? So you're saying Israel adopting a preemptive strategy, is that something, how are Middle Eastern countries reacting to that? Oh, okay. Yeah, I think everybody in the world is worried about the, the precedent of the preemptive doctrine because it's so new and because um, the U.S. Has, has launched two wars within a year. Um, so I think there is some, or a year and a half, I think it is something that people are wrestling with. You certainly saw after the, um, after the initial invasion, the way Syria reacted, um, they were very nervous when Secretary Rumsfeld and others were criticizing the Syrians for um, facilitating the flow of, of weapons and people into Iraq, in and, in and out of Iraq, and they felt that they were gonna be next. Um, and I think that that's why you've seen Bush administration officials sort of rush to say, no, we're not going at militarily after every point in the axis of evil. Um, so, and, and whether Israel, I mean, whether they've set a president for Israel or anybody for them, I mean, not, not, not just Israel, if a country, have they said now, have they broken all the sort of foreign policy norms? Can any country now sort of strike someone preemptively if they feel they're at risk? Perhaps, I don't know. Um, but as the world superpower, post 9-11, they sort of, this is what they've come up with. Um, the question of whether sort of the U.S. is undermining its rhetoric on democracy. I think maybe. Um, for example, in Egypt, 
Um, Gamal Mubarak, Hosni Mubarak, the president, is, is somewhat ill. He's, he's getting older. And everybody there knows that Gamal Mubarak, his son, is sort of being primed to be the successor. Um, and people in Egypt aren't so happy about it. And yet when he comes to Washington, he's feted by the administration as, you know, and, and they're very nice to him and they're treating him as a potential successor. The same with Bashar al-Assad, uh, son of Hafez al-Assad, who, when he, we quickly embraced him, we, the president in his speech, another example, um, sort of was very hesitant, you probably saw, to criticize Egypt or Saudi Arabia and um, welcomed municipal elections in Saudi Arabia even though women are not going to be allowed to participate them, in them, for example. Same thing in Kuwait, women can't vote. I mean, so we're, I think this is an issue that they're wrestling with um, and that's why I made the point in my, in my opening remarks that I'm not sure how committed they are physically to, you know, to really putting pressure on these countries. Yeah, I have two questions. First, uh, talking on Middle East peace plan and the North Korea's roadmap, which do you feel would be a viable solution if I were to do? And second, how do you feel about Iran's nuclear situation with the United Nations will affect the Middle East peace process? Which, which Kofi Annan peace plan? You mean that he endorsed the Geneva Initiative? Something yeah. called the Geneva Initiative? Yes. Um, well, the, the funny thing about this is that you, you, know, you have this Geneva Initiative hashed out between former left Israeli peace negotiators, Yossi Valen and others, um, and former Palestinian negotiators, which has just sparked deep um, anger uh, in, by Ariel Sharon. Um, feels like it's undermining his negotiating stance. Um, and the U.S. has kind of referred to it as sort of a helpful dialogue measure, and that's upset the Israelis too, that the U.S. has even said that. Um, but they're actually very similar in their, in their premise. I mean, the Geneva Initiative just goes further. It's 40 pages. You can read it on the internet versus the seven-page roadmap, which is kind of just a sort of step-by-step -step vague. It wasn't a peace plan. It's just more of a sort of a strategy timetable um, and doesn't, obviously wasn't successful. So um, Kofi Annan has endorsed the Geneva Initiative and which one is better? I'd say they're just different. I mean, one is, is a more detailed version of the other, I'd say. Um, and I think that one of the reasons that the U.S. can't go any further in endorsing the Geneva Initiative, even if they like it, someone did all the work for them, hashed it out, is because Israel has rejected it and they don't want to, and they're not going to pick a fight with Israel over this. And it's just, this is their plan. Their plan is the roadmap. But the roadmap is, is like sitting on a, on, a, 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 I don't know, some closet right now in the State Department. No one's really working the issue right now, I'd say. The second question was um, on Iran. There's a lot going on in Iran right now. They, they, the Europeans went to Tehran and got a commitment from them that they were not pursuing, uh, using their nuclear program for malicious means, essentially. And the U.S. said, okay, let's see you prove it. Um, I think I saw before I came out here today that the U.N. is now saying that there's, they haven't found any evidence yet of Iran de developing a nuclear weapons program. This is really going to be a conflict again between the U.S. and the U.N. If, if this, but they also said, but you know, Iran has sort of been misleading about this issue in the past. Um, there's a November 20th, I think, deadline for discussion at the IAEA, the U.N. nuclear watchdog arm, about what to do about Iran. The U.S., ironically, wants this issue referred to the U.N. Security Council, that organization that they bashed during the whole Iraq war. Um, to get it decided. And I think the reason is because they, they can't, they don't have a military option um, against Iran. Um, it's just far more complex. And so they, they have to use diplomacy here. Um, and they're hoping that there's enough consensus that a nuclear armed Iran, a nuclear weaponized Iran would be dangerous for everybody. Um, but right now, sort of a fragile moment in sort of determining what to do, what they're doing. Um, and one of the issues that, one of the main dialogue, diplom diplomatic channels is actually U.S.-Russia um, and sort of because Russia is supplying a lot of the nuclear technology for the program and the U.S. trying to put pressure on Russia. Um, but sort of, I anticipate that it's probably going to go to the U.N. Security Council by next month. Yeah. Another question. Mm -hmm.
Okay, yeah, there was a poll uh, about 10 days ago um, carried out by a guy named Itamar Marcus, something called Palestinian Media Watch. Um, they did a poll, and when asked if Hamas and Islamic Jihad should continue their armed struggle against Israel if Israel leaves all of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza, and grants statehood to the Palestinians, 59% said yes. Not a figure that's going to encourage peace moves on Israel's part, I don't think. But I guess also we have to sort of view it in the context of what's been going on and that life is really bad in the West Bank right now. And I'm, I'm assuming that that number would change, perhaps. But I don't know. I'm not a pollster and I'm not living in the West Bank and Gaza right now. So I don't have my finger totally on the pulse of what's going on. I know that one of the things that you're seeing is sort of a, a from you know, talking to people and reading and being there briefly in August is that, you know, sort of a lot of anti-Americanism too, whereas before maybe it was just directed towards Israel, a lot of anti-Americanism. Um, yeah, I've seen a lot of polls. There was another poll by Khalil Shikaki, a Palestinian pollster, who showed after that October 4th Haifa bombing that 75% of Palestinians supported that bombing. These are not very hopeful figures. Um, whether there can be progress under Yasser Arafat, it doesn't seem like it. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like it. Um, Certainly, the, the current constellation that we have with Arafat, Ariel Sharon, it's not working. Um, and I think that the peace plans are there. We've got the Geneva Initiative. We've got the Ami Ayalon Sari Nuseiba Initiative. We've got the roadmap. We've got any number of peace plans. And I think probably uh, majorities on both sides who really do would accept a, a long-term peace plan. I think both Israelis and Palestinians are very hawkish in the short term. And in the long term, it could be if there's a little bit more dovish. But there seems to be a lack of leadership really willing to implement. And, and Arafat has just um, not, you know, not proven uh, to be a, a really uh, adequate peace partner, I'd say. And I think a lot of Palestinians would say that, too. Uh, maybe people will disagree with me here and say that he's, he really is a peacemaker. Are there certain movements that you think are being undercovered? Like we, we don't kill. Like there are so many movements, like peaceful movements, towards uh, the end of the destruction of the, uh, in the West Bank, uh -huh. uh, towards stopping the wall because it's intersecting all these cities that we have. There's a university in Jerusalem called Al-Quds University. The wall has intersected two halves. And there's like all the students were in the tent for like three or four weeks. It was like a month and a half just to stop or even to reroute the wall that we didn't hear about in the US media, although that was covered in the European media. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for the questions. <clears throat> Your first question, is it that the U.S., I mean, I think it was both, what's it going to take to, it started out as sort of what's it going to take for the U.S. to be more engaged, but then it was sort of when is the U.S. going to stop unconditionally supporting Israel at the U.N., I think. Um, it's not going to, probably. Certainly at the U.N., which is hostile to Israel and that they're just, they're going to, unless a, a resolution sort of addresses the fact that, you know, if it's something about what's going on in the region and it, it focuses only on the Palestinian side and there's no mention of the killing of Israelis, they're going to veto it. Um, and the U.S. sort of protects Israel at the U.N. So I don't, I don't think there's going to be a change there. Um, when it comes to the media coverage, perhaps you're right. Perhaps there needs to be more more coverage of, of peaceful protests. I, I mean, I remember do seeing some reports, and I guess it depends what you read. Um, unfortunately, I think that the media in general, after three years of, more than three years of intifada now, um, has the, the bar for getting anything in the paper right now is very high. If you're a reporter in Israel or the West Bank, um, 
you know, it's got to be something horrific and terrible, and maybe we're not getting enough coverage of sort of, like you said, those kind of demonstrations. I feel like these new peace initiatives, though, um, peaceful peace initiatives like the Geneva Initiative have gotten an extraordinary level of coverage, um, given something that's sort of, ex you know, not governmental. Um, the fact that there's going to be a signing ceremony, and Yossi Balin wrote to Colin Powell, and everybody knows about it. Um, and I know when they come to Washington, that these people, that there's, there's been a lot of coverage. Um, so, I don't know, suggest you write to the editor of your paper and, and find out why they're not reporting on that more. Well, I think that most, the second question first, that most of the peace plans that are out there are sort of a variation on um, probably what uh, President Clinton mediated towards the end of his presidency in December, two, when was it? 2000, 99. December 9, well, God, I can't remember. When did President, December 2000, right? The Intifada broke out in September, and, and then they had some more negotiations that were going on. It was sort of a, two-state solution, divided Jerusalem, some sort of arrangement on the Temple Mount, um, Haram al-Sharif, um, right of return of Palestinian refugees to